Tell me that sentence again you just said, that this, you said, scripture is not that kind of response to uncertainty. Well, yes, that scripture, I mean, of course, however much we focus in on particular texts, which I've spent my life doing, we always have to zoom out again and see the, the bigger picture. Yeah. And so I'm constantly saying to people, yes, you've got that bit in the book of Amos, but you can't take that by itself. That belongs along with Job and particularly along with the Psalms and eventually along with Jesus in the Gospels as yes. well. And and, uh, you know, there are times when Jesus says, unless you repent, you'll all have Roman swords cutting you down in the temple and so on. There may be a quid pro quo time, but there are many other times when Jesus says things like, um, don't ask whether it was this man's fault or his parents that he was born blind. Th this is in the mystery of God. Yeah. And, and let's just see what God, what God is now going to do. Yeah. And the other thing which I was really struck by um, was that bit at the end of Acts 11, where a prophet says there's going to be a great famine and they don't say, oh, it's because the Romans have sinned or it's because that church has done something bad. Yeah. Um, th they don't say any of that. They say, who's going to be at risk here? What can we do to help and who should we send? Yeah. And out of lament grows love and, and the sharing of that across ethnic and, and geographical yes. boundaries, which is really quite powerful. Yes. Why do you think we have such a low tolerance for uncertainty right now? Because we're children of the 18th century, and there's a bit of the rationalist in us, mm -hmm. and that fights with the romantic, of course, because it's done ever since the 18th century. But I think... And there's, there's probably more rationalist apologetics still going on in America than there are in Britain. But if then, if uh, then. And then God does this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, so you have a God who is a, a quid pro quo God. Yes. And in a sense, that's a way of talking about, you know, God is not flailing around. He's not random. He's not unjust. And yes. ultimately, but it is ultimately, God will be seen to be just. And the vindication of the justice of God is partly what Romans is all about. But it remains uh, very mysterious, very dark. And if you believe in the justice of God, you also have to believe, according to Romans 8, in those moments of, of unknowing, mm. when even God the Holy Spirit hasn't got words to say the spirit is groaning without words <laughs> and you know, if god the holy spirit hasn't mm. got words to say to express the horror of what's i mean yes, think of, right. uh, i was lecturing on this last year yeah. in, in, just as the ukraine war was starting yeah and i've got a friend in ukraine who is emailing maggie and me quite regularly and you just think there is no explanation for this except it's just horrible yeah. and we have to lament yes and and trust that somehow out of that something will happen but we don't know what i think people who have felt very um you know that scripture always ends up being like holding the holding the wrong side of the dagger that it's always the blade yeah. always oh, yeah, the yeah. blade uh, 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 uh. i think someone hearing you say that who you know, I'm talking to N.T. Wright. You could be the Bible answer factory, you know, <laughs> that we could just like put in a question and then get fed <laughs> the answer. And I think knowing that when we that that feeling of being unraveled by by mm. by plague, by mm. the death of a child, by the end of a relationship, yeah, that yeah, when yeah. they get to the end of themselves, that they don't then feel. Yeah. Like their misery yeah. is an affront yeah. to God or or just the the fundamental sign that they're not faithful yeah. enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I remember the first time I had, for some reason, to preach on Psalm 88, which is the darkest of all the Psalms, and just ends up, lover and friend you've put away from me, and darkness is my only companion. End of Psalm. And, and because we're good Anglicans, we sing, glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you know, at the end of that psalm, I see. but you kind of yeah. tremble, sing it through trembling. Yes. That somehow we hold on to that darkness is my only companion, remembering yes. Gethsemane and the three hours on the cross. Yeah. Um, that 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 is that is part of the deal. That's part of who we are, yes. and it's part of the. Of, can I put it like this? Part of the glorious humanness of Jesus. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things that I learned through one of my graduate students who's working on Romans 8 and looking at 
the way the word glory there comes out of Psalm 8, where human beings are crowned with glory and honor with all things put in subjection under their feet. But the present form that the glory takes is the suffering and the prayer, um, because that suffering and prayer is mysteriously part of the way in which what happened on the cross is being turned into living spirit-driven prayer here and now and that that is how god is working what he's working that's the, the, the it's, it's that extraordinary thing that the spirit is doing and it's precisely when we don't know what to say and when the spirit doesn't know what to say but 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 there is this groaning yeah.